Uh, welcome all of you tonight. It's good to be here together. Those in uh, join us on live stream. This is the fellowship in the truth and in the sun. Tonight, this will be our 75th lesson in, uh, in Genesis. We're nearing the end of the book. And we're being introduced to divine manners all, all through this. And it'll be the same tonight. Tonight we commence the 40, 47th chapter. Jacob and the household are going to arrive in Egypt. Well, there are going to be a lot of blessed pictures here that we're going to see. First 12 verses of chapter 47. Then Pharaoh came and, and then Joseph came and told Pharaoh, and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said moreover to Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, and Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren, gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his house, father's household with bread according to their families. <laughs> That's a lot summed up in just a few words. I guess you noticed that. Now, I remember that uh, the scriptures are really about Christ, or it to be more accurate, they testify of Christ. And so we're going to see uh, likenesses of Christ and salvation in this book. It's by, it's by divine intention. It just, just didn't happen. It's that God looked at it and said, no, well, that's just like what I'm going to do. It, uh, this is just like creation. See, it was deliberate. It deliberately reflected the nature of things. This is one of the ways God's teaching people.
Jacob and all his offspring went down into Egypt. Exodus tells us they were 70 in number. Years later, when they stood at the border of the Promised Land, <coughs> they'd really grown a lot. Now, for the first 230 years, they just went from 1 to 70. 1 to 70. That's all they, further they went. I showed at the border of the Promised Land, they, they had just males from 20 years and up that were able to war. There were 601,780. Now I have a little, I, I, I was going to include this the last time in our, our lesson, but I did, I give a little chart there the name of the people that came from the children, all of the ites, there's a lot of them, as you can see. There are 59 different nations right there. And then each of these get offspring that had nations come from them. Remember he told that a multitude of nations would come from Abraham, he said. And then we see uh, how many, how many came into Egypt? There were, there were 70 named by wives. Leah, all the ones born of her and their family was 33. Through Zilpah was 16. Through Bilhah was 7. Through Rachel was 14. So 70 people came in. And here's this count of 601,730, just the males. That didn't include any adult women or any children, girls, boys, any children. Didn't include anyone under 20. And it didn't, didn't include anyone from 20 on up who couldn't fight. So a conservative estimate would be somewhere between three and five million toward the, toward the five side. Now this was all the working of the Lord. So the Lord can suddenly explode the number of... <laughs> Amen. The latter is bigger than the former. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the last is first. Mm -hmm. See, up to this point here, we believers have been last. Mm -hmm. But there's going to come a time when we're going to be first. Amen even in number. That's right. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You think, well, that's going to take a long time to happen. No. You can have it rather swiftly, as is demonstrated here. Now, let me forget, God's been working all this out. The entire episode, starting with Joseph being sold to the Ishmaelites, who gave, sold him to the Midianites, who sold him to the Potiphar. God was seen in all of this. Joseph was sold by his brothers, but Acts 7 9, speaking of that occasion, said, God was with him. Yeah, right. Upon arriving in Egypt, he was a in the house of Potiphar and was a slave to Potiphar, but as it is written, Genesis 39, 2 through 3, God, the Lord, was with him. Being with, bring, being with Joseph, the Lord blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake and put Joseph in complete charge of his house, Potiphar did. After false charges were raised against him, he was put in prison. But the scripture says, the Lord was with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the prison keeper spotted him and made him head over all the prisoners. Now, I'm say, mentioning these things that God did this. Mm -hmm. But if you just read the account, you might read over and not even think of this. Because yeah. that's why we're mentioning it. When he was put in prison unjustly, God was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it. I said, the Lord made it. 
I say the Lord made it prosper. Amen. Amen. See, God can do things like this. Yeah. Believe me, if you don't need if you don't need to hear this now, you'll come a time when you need to know it. Mm -hmm. You need to know God can make what you're doing prosper. Yes. Amen. Even under very adverse circumstances. Then when he was in prison, God enabled him to interpret dreams of the baker and the butler was all fitting in God's plan. Pharaoh, they just happened to irritate Pharaoh and he had him imprisoned and delivered into the charge of Joseph, getting ready for future work. He interpreted the dreams and then he was eventually let out. Then these famines came and Psalm 105 says, God called for a famine. Sometimes God calls for a tsunami. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got to see this. God called for an earthquake. Yeah, right. God called for a tornado. This is God's world. These things can't happen apart from God. Yeah, right. This is God's world. Yeah. He called for a famine. He says he broke the staff of all bread. He just, people couldn't get any bread. Then it says he sent Joseph. See, God's been in all this. He sent Joseph to have a posterity for Jacob and to save much people alive. While he is in prison, the word of the Lord tried or tested or strengthened. I mean, if God wasn't trying to see what was in him, I mean, God knew what was in him. This was all strengthening him and getting him ready. Amen. Believe me when I tell you, God won't use you until you've learned to suffer. This is the truth, what I'm telling you. Those that have it easy all the time, they're not going to do much for God. That's not the kind of people God uses. If you're familiar with Scripture, you know this. God brought, brought Joseph out of prison, and he was, became the ruler over Egypt, but the only person he wasn't over was Pharaoh himself. And under divine supervision, Jacob increased his people greatly in the land of Ham. That's Psalm 105, verse 24. So there's a principle in Scripture that what the Lord purposes, he does. Now, the work is in believing that. What he purposes, he does. What he begins, he finishes. He doesn't abandon his work. Men abandon their works. God doesn't. Abandon his work. God may force men to abandon their work. That's right. See, it's not that God looks at earth and takes all this jumbled up mess and kind of puts it together and makes it turn. He's causing the mess. So he can work it out. Because he, when he causes a mess, it's like an impossible mess. So God's purpose drives everything. Now some people see all of they don't like this, but I don't really care. I'm not attracted to people like that. I don't I don't care what they think. It's a God would never do that. You mean like he'd never call for a famine? You mean he'd never break the staff of all bread? <laughs> Joseph saw it. He said, you meant it. To what you did to me, it was wrong. It was morally wrong. But God meant it for good. God moved you to do this because I probably would have never left home. <laughs> I'd have probably just stayed at home. He, he moved you so I get out of so I get out from under your influence. God was in it. So there you have... Uh, I had advance notice of what it means that God will work all things together for good to them that love him. See, that there it is, way back here in Genesis, there it is being worked out. The point to be seen in all of this is that God purposes, that what God purposes and ordains, he himself carries out. His activity is the primary activity and men's involvement is supervised by him that's the way the that's the way things work and he does that this without men being mere robots see 
It really looks like they're doing it. And they really think they're doing it. But it's God who's working all in all. Yes. Told, say not, we will go here and we'll do this and do that. If the Lord permit, we will do this. And Amen. Do that. Mm -hmm. See, this working of God is not just true of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all. It's true in his great salvation. In fact, that is what caused this back here. Yes, that's right. Amen. If we fail to see this, our review of Genesis will just be in vain. It'll just be like a book, yep. book study and <laughs> it'd be about it. Well, he arrived in the land, that's where we left off, and now Joseph comes to Pharaoh, and he tells them they're here now. My mother and my, my father and brothers are all here. He, when Joseph was exalted to be ruler over all Egypt, Pharaoh said, Thou shalt be over my house. According to thy word shall all my people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So Joseph comes to Pharaoh because Pharaoh wasn't under him. He was under Pharaoh. He didn't have somebody else tell him they're here. See, he submitted to him here. Came and told him they're here. God said he See, Satan, Satan, he doesn't submit to God. Yeah, right. say, we are told that he reasoned in his heart. He said, um, I will, see, Joseph could have thought like this. If Joseph would have been, would yield to Satan, he'd have thought this same way. Now that I'm up here, I'm going to, yeah. but he didn't. Satan reasoned, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, I can tell you from experience that some people are really nice until they're exalted. They're really close friends until they're promoted. You were close in the school, but when they became the reverend of the mega church, they forgot all about you. That isn't the way Joseph was. Absalom, he was like this. I'm showing you that Satan couldn't get a hold of Joseph. He... He had the position, but he didn't exploit the position he at all. Absalom reasoned this way. Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him, and on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole a hearts. Absalom stole a hearts of the people. He was the king's son, but he wasn't uh, satisfied to be the king's son. He wanted to be everything. See? That's how Satan is. That's how Absalom was. That's not how Joseph was. This is not the kind of spirit Joseph had. Some people can't stand a lot of responsibility. If you live close to God, he'll protect you here. He won't put you in a position that you can't handle. But you, you got to have faith. You have to trust him here. Some people, are they, they wish they were a higher up. Well, if you serve God and you don't end up there, it's because you don't belong there. That's the way it is. You can go to school and take a course on it. How to be the boss. That's right. They have, they have courses to teach people how to be bosses. And we know how they turn out. Our Joplin businesses, we know how these bosses turn out. And it's not good.
Well, he said, my father and my brethren are here. Pharaoh sent uh, word through Joseph's brothers to Jacob before, before they came. He said, this do ye, laid your beast, go and get you to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come unto me. And I will give you the good land of Egypt. <laughs> That's what they did. He was the, uh, he was the ruler. Now in response to Pharaoh's lower directive and God's higher directive, <laughs> he worked through. See, they, he had, Jacob had a hard time believing his boys when they told him this, but now we got a word from Pharaoh. That's right, yeah. Now we got a word from Pharaoh. See? See how God's working here? He breaks down any kind of resistance. And by, uh, they're in the land of Goshen. Uh, Joseph told his brothers they'd be dwelling in the land of Goshen. It's like a prophecy. He told them when Pharaoh asked their occupation, now you should say, thy servants trade has been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. That's what J Joseph told them to tell them. That you need to dwell in Goshen, see? Mm -hmm. Your trade is such that you can't you can't live in the city of Pithom. Mm -hmm. you, you can't dwell where most Egyptians dwell. You can't because that's not your trade. You need this land for your trade. It's evident that the land of Goshen was ideal for their manner of life. Mm -hmm. So Joseph labors to ensure that you'll get what you need. You'll be in the right place for what you're doing. Now here's a point to be seen, it's very important. For some people this is a difficult lesson to learn. To locate in a place conducive to spiritual maturity and development. Some people have a hard time seeing this. Even though God places those who are saved, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him, mm -hmm. that's what it says he does. Yes, it's 1 Corinthians 12, 18. Mm -hmm. Some insist on abiding in a place and manner that is convenient to the flesh and not conducive to their role in the body. He puts them in the body where it pleased him. And you read the rest of 1 Corinthians 12, and it tells you that every part's a functioning part that has a direct bearing on all the other parts. Now, historically, there have been very, 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 very few great men of God that have seen this. Almost all of them were great leaders and the congregation was mute. Almost every one of them. Very few exceptions. This has been very, very difficult for people to grasp. But the body of Christ is to the believer what Goshen was to Jacob and his household. Now God has spelled out what's to be done with the body. He's placed gifts in the body and or there were speaking gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they were all articulating gifts for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, it's everybody measuring up to what, what they are and have, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, with the, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, for by they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. Amen. I'm going to say it again. 
there have been few great men of Christian history that actually did that. So you would have to check it and see if I'm not telling you the truth. But it's spelled out. It's spelled out right there. Under ordinary circumstances, these objectives can't be met other than with a body. There's too, it's too big. The scope is too big for it to be handled by, quote, a church staff. It just is too big. Now, it doesn't start out this way. I understand. But this is what, this is what you're to build toward. Yes. You're to build toward. We've made some progress. We're not there yet, but we've made some progress. So we've been 20, 22 years working at this. Yeah. Just to show you what kind of time, what it takes at our age to do something like this. Yeah. All kind of erroneous ideas had to be thrown down. Yeah. There's nothing unclear about the revelation. Yeah. It's very clear. The priority is the edification of the saints. For without that, the ultimate objective of the church, to present it as a chaste virgin to Christ, will not be accomplished. Difficult for a person to even be convinced that what they have is worthy of speaking yeah. in the assembly. They, you have to build confidence to see that God has put you here. Now, what you what he gives you to say, he wants you to say it. He really yeah. wants you to speak up and say it. But see, this is not easy, like you've already said. No, it is. You have to know what you're talking about, too. This isn't... Make no mistake about this. This just doesn't mean everybody says something. This all... You've got to be holding to the head. Right. It's got to come from the head through you. If it doesn't, yeah. you, it, there, there are no place for you to say it. But that, that's, that's how intricate this body of Christ is. And it's been very, I don't know if the world's ever seen something like this. Church of Jerusalem, Church of Antioch had a lot of prophets and so forth in it. But this, uh, this is a big agenda. But this is what eternity is going to be like. Yes, amen. Being schooled for there. Now, Jesus operated... His ministry, performing his ministry with God's priorities in mind. He said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only say what the Father tells me to say. See? This is how it works. Now, Joseph presents some of some of his brethren. He doesn't, he doesn't say, all at all, 11 you. He just takes five. Just takes five. Brings them to Pharaoh. He took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them to Pharaoh. He doesn't bring them all. There's a variety of views put forth about this. I list them over there. I don't, you know, I have to pay much attention to them, but... People have guessed why, why he did this. Now I see Joseph is presenting the most favorable of his brothers, the ones that would best present the idea of shepherds. If any questions were asked about shepherds, they could they could answer. These ones that best emulated real shepherds and knew what they were doing, exhibited the way of handling flocks. If, if, the, if the Egyptians viewed shepherds as an abomination, you better not set mediocre shepherds up here. So that's, that's what I think this was. It's so that there'd be no objection to them dwelling in Goshen. The only reason Goshen was dwelt is they were shepherds. And they needed this area to shepherd their flocks. Now Pharaoh's got to be convinced these are real shepherds. These aren't people that were trained to be shepherds. They're shepherds. Amen. Amen. They've been shepherding. That's right. yeah. They're not going to learn the art of shepherding while they're here. They've already got it down. Amen. They learned it from their fathers. So they presented them to, a, to Pharaoh. To present means a scepter. Place on exhibit. Yes. You can't help but think with Joseph being such a 
such an uh, obvious example of Christ yeah, that <laughs> that this is this is also a prefigurement of Christ presenting His brethren to the Father. Amen. Uh, Amen. I and the children that you have given, given me. Mm -hmm. Now that principle, of course, is clear here that when exhibiting someone representing the body of Christ <laughs> or someone who's being recommended for a place of service, <laughs> you need to choose the best examples. You say, well, I don't think that's right. Well, give me a moment here. This is how the early, uh, early church did it. When the early church was told to select men to handle a distribution of food to the widows, here's what he said, Choose out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. <laughs> Bring us the best men. Bring us the best men for this work. When recommending men to carry letters to the Gentile churches, Barnabas and Paul were described as men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I reckon she recommended them. When admonishing the Corinthian brethren to receive certain men, Paul wrote, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that he is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to every one that helpeth with us in labor. See, set, <laughs> set the best before him. Younger believers said, Don't let no man despise you. You'd be thou an example of the believers. Be an example of the believers. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Let's set the, book. Let's set the best out there if we're going to exhibit them. Both elders and deacons had, they were to be the best among the congregation. I found they generally were almost the worst. That's been my experience. And some of you have had the same experience. We won't dwell on that. And he, he tells you what, they, what the men to look for. See, all believers are accepted by Christ, but all believers are not on the same spiritual level. Recommendation for certain godly works and holding for certain people as believers should be done with these things in mind. See, being of good report is important. Should be understood that this has to do with the way a person lives. Of good report didn't necessarily, and some of these it had to do with what they comprehended and this sort of thing, but it mainly had to do with their conduct before people. How are they, how are they seen? Do they have integrity? Are they zealous? Do they do their work right? This sort of thing. Each labor in the kingdom must be a suitable representative of Christ. If you're a lousy employee, you reflect on the people of God. So just Stop being that way. And Pharaoh said to his brethren, Well, what is your occupation? <coughs> well, they must have appeared in their best attire. They didn't come with the shepherd's clothes and the staffs in their hand, or he wouldn't have had to ask that question. Yeah. Joseph said he's going to ask that question because he knew. Pharaoh didn't get where he's at because he was not wise or didn't take care of what he did. He wasn't about to give the land to Goshen to somebody who wasn't what they said they were. So what is your occupation? He's going to determine whether they're really shepherds or not. Uh, here's something to ponder. When people are told that so-and-so are Christian, is a Christian, conscientious people want to know, is that really true? We can't tell you how much difficulty we had because we read the Christian business phone book. I don't recommend that to anybody, incidentally. You've got to go a little bit further than that. We were recommended, our home here was recommended the work 
was a was a creed was recommended as a Christian mm -hmm. turned out to be the biggest thief any of us have ever met. Mm -hmm. It's important. Even even Pharaoh knew yeah. that you had to you had to prove with the persons what they say they are. Uh -huh. First of all. Now, Jesus, in the scriptures, we are told the reason why Christ died and rose again. I know Christ died for your sins. Yes, he did. But that's not a complete statement. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Yes. That dear brothers and sisters, is what has to be displayed. There can't be any question about who you're living for. Amen. Now, I understand it's gonna, this is something you work out, but yeah, no one can work it out for you, but that's, that's a target. God's told us. Of course, it's quite common to view the church as a collection of people that are struggling with sin. <laughs> this is almost a universal view, perception of the church. Of course, we can tell them why they're struggling with sin. They haven't put off the old man and put on the new man like they have been told. So when someone says, what is your profession? You say, I'm a Christian. Make sure that is the truth. Clothes for them to put on. Oh yeah, favorite, yes, several yeah, changes. Yeah, several changes. Yeah, we mentioned back then that probably some of them was for this occasion. Yeah, I said several. Put on this when yes, you come right. before. That's right. Put those new clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your occupation? Well, the answer. Well, we're thy servant. Notice the humility. Thy servants. We're in your country now. They didn't say. We don't care what you say. We're servants of God. They were servants of God. Yes, Brother Jason. Yeah, on, this, on this theme of making sure you're a believer, I, I think that <clears throat> there's a couple of really grave mistakes that are made in, in the churches. One, one is that church leaders assume that if people walk in the door, they're Christian. And there's very little effort to... Like preach the gospel or tell people that come to church that they're sinners, because there's an, it's just an assumption if they're there, yeah. then they must be in. And then on the other hand, there are a lot of people that just assume they're in, and the assumption is based on well, I was born in a Christian home, mm -hmm. or or I'm a member of a church and I go to church, and that and that's really of course really, I'm a Christian. And of course I'm a Christian. Yeah, yeah. I, I because I you know I go to church at least seventy five percent of the time or something. You know, something like that. And so there, there's, you go out into churches and there are, churches like a giant mission field. There are all kinds of people there yeah. that don't have any idea what it even means to be a Christian. Yeah. But they think they are. Yes. And they're treated that way. Yes. And never taught the gospel, never preached the gospel, never told about their sins. So they never, they never converted. Yeah. So you have, you have lots and lots of people in the church. It doesn't mean they're all wicked people. No. Or immoral people. Some of them are very moral people, but they're not born again people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah this, I know that from a personal viewpoint, this is why I said examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. If you're in the faith, you should be the first one to know. To know, but see, it takes self examination, You not assumption. If we, we can't assume our own part in the kingdom of God, we can't assume it. If you got the real thing, it'll hold up under scrutiny. It will. Yes, that is a, well, that's a lamentable situation that Brother Jason has just identified, and it is tragic, actually, because it, it, it hurts the people. The people are actually are victims of this because it kind of puts them to sleep. Keep in mind that every shepherd was an abomination to the Egyptians, remember? Genesis 46, 34. Yet the brothers didn't draw back and say, look, Pharaoh, we, we have to apologize that we're shepherds because we know in your country that 
shepherds are kind of contemptible and they don't like shepherds. See, they didn't, they didn't approach it this way. They just boldly come right out and said, we're shepherds. And that's been our, that's why we're asking for Goshen. They were unashamed. And, and Joseph was unashamed to tell Pharaoh they're shepherds, even though this was, this was not a popular occupation in Egypt. Now, uh, they said, we've, we've come to sojourn here. We, we've come to sojourn. Now, it's interesting what some of the versions say. I mean, let me share with you what some of them say. The New King James Version says, we come to dwell in the land. We come to live here for a while, the NIV says, to reside here as aliens, New Revised Standard Version, to make a living, that's the basic Bible English, as immigrants. We came here to live in the land. We come to live here for a while. We come to live as a temporary residence, to stay in this country for a time being. We have come to, the, to live here in Egypt. We have come to stay in the land. The Message Bible says to find a new place to live. Well, see, some of these things, they miss the point. Sojourn is the right point. It's the right word. Now, they're going to sojourn for 430 years. It doesn't sound like a sojourn, does it? It sounds like a five or six lifetimes. But it wasn't sojourn. I mean, we don't belong here, but under these circumstances, it's best for us to be here. But first chance we have to get out of here, we're going to leave. Now, it's, I remember, and Sister June can probably remember when when I had to uh, earn a living in the world, I sort of made a vow. I said, I'm going to do this as long as I have to do this. I only had to do it for all total about 35 years. That's all I had to do it. Then I was freed up <laughs> to come here. There's, 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 there's parts of your life that you presently, you have to occupy it. But in your mind, you don't want to like settle, settle down. And there has to be an open door that God opens or something of this sort. So we're sojourners. We have the posture of sojourners. In the world, to say nothing of in certain places, in the world we're sojourners. We've come to sojourn in the, in the land. Now, I don't know uh, how to the extent to which Joseph's brothers understood the Abrahamic promise, or that it would be there 400 years of opposition. I don't know how clear this was to them. Joseph, Joseph knew it, and years later, Moses knew it. They knew they were eventually coming out of, the, coming out of Egypt, but at this point, I don't, I don't know how clear this was to them. Some years later, before Joseph died, he said, you're coming out. The, which this is remarkable that this this just a couple of sentences this is just a couple of sentences in the whole Bible about this in all the revelation is just a couple of sentences but he said I know Abraham will he'll command his children after him I, I can I can trust him with this and he he did he passed it on and they passed it on and yeah. got down to Moses day it had been passed passed down all along. Glorious to ponder it, isn't it? Remember that uh, Stephen says that Moses, when he killed that Egyptian that was oppressing his brethren, he said he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. How did he know that? Well, that, that must have been traced back to his mother when she teached him when he was weaned. I told this a lot of times, but there's a black preacher in Gary, Indiana. He's a friend of mine. He said, he said in the in the daytime, Pharaoh's daughter taught Moses, and in the nighttime, his mama taught him. And there come a time when the nighttime teaching overtook the daytime teaching. <laughs> well, that time did come. See that time come? Moses kind of put it put it together and he was 
He was born when they were killing all the male babies by by edict by the by Pharaoh. And his his mother. His it specifies his mother. His mother saw him that he was a goodly child, and she hid him three months. Now, some of you mothers probably could understand how remarkable it is that nobody heard this baby for three months. Huh? huh? <laughs> she hid him for three months undetected. She saw he was a goodly child. I do not doubt that at that time God let, let her know this, this is going to be the one here. It wasn't just he was a good-looking baby. I mean, it, it, it had to go deeper than that. And I'm, I'm persuaded that that was made known unto her, and while she was weaning him, he was a young boy raising him up in Pharaoh's house, and she taught him, taught him this. Now, here's something to ponder, that the posture of the saints today is much like the Israelites during their oppression. We're in a land that's really not ours, and God doesn't intend. I dedicate this to the health and wealth preachers, incidentally. And the Lord doesn't intend that this world be ours. We got something better than that uh, on the agenda. And when Jesus comes, we're going to be de re delivered from this world. And see, while, while we're waiting, we're waiting for a better country. A, a better, that is a heavenly. See, see, it's, it's not even a really nice place in the world. Right. It's a better country. So we're in the same position they were in. We're sojourning. We may live and we're going to live and die here unless Jesus comes and yeah. changes us immediately. See, Jesus told us in the meantime, I said, beware of covetousness because of the abundance of a man's does a uh, man's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. So it's not who has the most toys, as the world thinks. <laughs> See, the life isn't just having a lot of stuff. Yes. Now, considering these two countries, the country of the promise it seemed to be lying in waste at this time. And then they came to Egypt, which was a land of plenty, because they yeah. had the corn stored yeah, and they were going to yeah. have provisions here. So if they lost sight of the promise of God about the promised land, yeah. then they might have thought that this was the place to be, and they would have lost that sojourning yeah. mindset. Mm -hmm. now, they, now they're there 430 years altogether, 400 under oppression. So that's several, several generations. I guess most people calculate that in that time, maybe a generation is like 50 years, but... It was several generations, but they passed this on <laughs> from generation. Do you realize there's some young people that grow up and they're adults before anyone ever tells them they're a stranger and a pilgrim? Amen. You gotta let your children know this young up. Yeah. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. God has something better planned for you, yeah. better country, a heavenly country. And a undefiled land. And it's possible for, well, we've got some children that kind of looking forward to it to as, as much as a child can, looking forward to it. So it's good to ponder those, those things. That text, uh, uh, beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Let me give that to you out of the Amplified Bible. Guard yourselves, keep free from all covetousness, the immoderate desire for wealth, the greedy longing to have more. For a man's life does not consist in and is not derived from possessing overflowing abundance or things which is over and above his needs. See, the world places a big priority on having more than you need. Maybe you lay it aside, you know. See, are you saying we shouldn't have a savings account? Uh, that's not, it, I'm not going to dignify that even with an answer. That's not the point. The point is in your heart where you are at home and where you're making the ma major preparation. Now, they told them right up front, they said, we don't have any pasture for our flocks. That's why we're here. 
Can there come a time when God's people don't have enough for what they need? The servant said, Thy servants have no pasture for their flock. So we, 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 need, we really need to talk about that? Mm. Of course there does. Yeah. Paul said, I learned how to suffer need. There's a certain spiritual posture you can maintain when you don't have what you need. Then I learn I know how to abound, have more than I need. Both the kind of both ends of the spectrum. We say with confidence that such a circumstance can't separate us from Christ, and it can't dull hope, even though it may may very well exist. It's a it's a fatal error to seek for and delight in security in this world. That can become like a, it can dominate you. I've known people that this was a, such a compelling desire that it dominated their life to to have enough. And while I'm here in this world, and, and you, it, it's all uncertain. All there is to come is a depression, and there you are. You lost everything you had, so you can't. You can't hang everything on this. You got to live a day at a time. Yeah. Amen. That's how you have to uh, live. No pasture for our flocks. So uh, and the famine. Whoa, the fam famine's bad in Canaan. That means it's get it's getting worse. Yeah. It's getting worse. So they said, now therefore we pray thee. We might, we might say please, you know. Uh, let thy servants dwell in Goshen. That's they'll have. I will have what we need there. Uh, someone might say, I think I want to cover this a bit later. I want to say it here. Someone might say, How could you have a famine in the land and pasture for cattle? How? Well, because there's a difference between grass and grain, <laughs> and the famine was of the grain. Not of the grass. Well, you could say, well, well, see, I'll say more about that a, bit, a little bit later. Now they ordered, see, they ordered their cause before Pharaoh. They presented their case before Pharaoh. We're shepherds. We've been shepherds all our lives. Our fathers were shepherds. We got our flat flocks here, brought them with us, and we, there's nothing in Canaan. we rest. So they presented their presented their cause to the Lord. Now this is a good art to practice, presenting your cause. We've talked about this before, but presenting your cause before the Lord, presenting your case. Why are you asking for what you're asking for? Uh -huh. Pharaoh say, why did you ask to live in Goshen? We've got some pretty nice cities here. Uh -huh. So they told him, uh -huh. why? Job, he didn't know why he was experiencing all these attacks. God never did tell him. He told you, but he didn't tell Job. How's that? Here's what he said. He's trying to, he, was, he can't have a dialogue with God. I don't know if he, if he was used to having him or what, but here's what he said. He said, oh, that I knew where I might find him that I might come before, even unto his seat, I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I, he told his, he reasoned that out with his friends. He said, I haven't, I haven't sinned. I've, I cared for the poor. He reasoned it out with his friends, but he wanted to reason it out with God. But he just didn't shoot up and pray into the air. I'd order my cause. With this case, God never let him do it because what happened to Job wasn't for his sake, it was for our sake. <laughs> it was for our sake. There is a kind of prayer, you know, James, that you can spend it on your lust. That's right. That's a lot right. Of, I think a lot of prayers are, oh, yes. are not answered because people are shallow and what they what they want is is not it's just for themselves it's, yes. it's not in line with the the seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness Amen. I think he said they might consume it yeah mm -hmm. they just use it up for themselves yeah it seems to me that there's 
sometimes a hesitancy for people to lay their case out. They say, well, I, I don't know if it's that important or not. And, but now the, the, Lord, the Lord opens the door for you on this. He said, be careful for nothing, filled with care, worry, and fretting. But in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests, there's, there's pleading the cause, see, that's what that is. Let your requests be made known unto God. Will you get what you want? That's not the point. What he'll do is he'll give you peace, Amen. which is really what's bothering you. Yeah, that's right. right? <laughs> you won't fret and care. And you ask the immediate response. Let your request, tell him what you want and why you want it. Tell him. Spell it out to him. And the peace of God, which keepeth all under, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you'll you'll remain stable. Yes, amen. And God, the working out of it, that's in God's hands. Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, said, Thy father and thy brethren are come to thee. Are come to thee. Wait a minute. He said that they were Pharaoh's servants. Pharaoh said, come to me. That's, what he, that's the word he said. Come to me. And he tells Joseph, thy father and thy brethren are come to thee. <coughs> for the sojourn in the land are we, the brother says, for the sojourn in the land are we come. Oh, let me put the, cut to the chase. Were it not for Joseph, Favor wouldn't have received him. Yes, amen. Joseph is why yes. he received them. Oh. <laughs> you can see the parallel. I know you can see the parallel. God's received you because of Jesus. Amen. You've come to Jesus, and Jesus has taken you to God. Amen. You can see that. Oh, it's a glorious. <laughs> It's glorious. That's one of those things that never goes old to me. He's able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by, not through, by, that is, like this. He takes you to the Father, brings us to God, put to death in the flesh that raised in the spirit that he might bring us to God, so it's it's what God thinks of Jesus that has moved Him to receive you, because you've believed on His Son and are trusting in His Son and relying on His Son, and that's He's why God received you. He says, uh, Pharaoh says, the land of Egypt is before you. Now he knows about the land of Egypt because he was made. A ruler over the gathering and the distribution of the grain. Remember that? So he'd been he'd been going through all the, if anyone knew what the best land was, now uh, Joseph would know what the best land was. Because he had to take the harvest, twenty percent of all the harvest, and store it up in the city, see, so he knew how he there's a reason why he knew Goshen. One God revealed it and second he'd been there, he knew. No more fit man uh, to recommend where to where to live. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Now I wanted again the best part of the land. I wanted to get touched on this subject about the grass. Because as I say, it sounds on the surface, it sounds strange. There was a famine in the land, but there's plenty of grass in Goshen. Now here's the promise God made to Israel that opens this up. Deuteronomy 11, 14, and 15. I will give you the rain of your land in his due, in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in the fields for thy cattle. that thou mayest eat and be full. I'll send grass for the cattle. They'll, do, they'll work the fields and so forth. 
the famine that Egypt experienced concerned the corn or the grain, not the grass. Jacob, Joseph did not give his brothers and their families provender cattle food <laughs> to eat. Now the spiritual parallel should be evident. We've been put into Christ who is the ultimate environment. The ultimate environment is Christ. That's, that's where the nourishment is. He had put us into Christ. That's where it is. And then in heavenly places, he had to be in the heavenly places. He raised up and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. That's where you get the food. Now, Pharaoh, he must have been impressed by the brothers he saw and everything. He said, look, if there's any man of activity among you, then make him make them rulers of my cattle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I imagine these were like prize cattle. The word activity, translated activity, has uh, the meaning of strength, might, efficiency, wealth. If the idea is men that can get the job done. That, that's, that's the kind of man. If there's anyone among you that can get the job done, that know how to do this, and we don't have to have a taskmaster put over them, if there's anybody like that, make them ruler over my cattle. Now, <laughs> you already know that a, a shepherd was an abomination to the Egyptians, whether it was one of Pharaoh's or not. But I don't imagine they complained about it. We have an interesting parallel in the body of Christ. That I've talked about before, but I'm becoming more and more persuaded of it. Christ appointed the care of the Gentiles to a Jew. That's the apostle he gave us. Care for us, a Jew. That are an abomination to people in the world. He's appropriately called the apostle and teacher of the Gentiles. While the church of that Jerusalem with other while the church in Jerusalem with other Jewish bodies were under Peter with James, not James, James, the Lord's brother, James, the Lord's brother, and John, they were over the circumcision of the Jewish churches. Paul said he recognized that. The, uh, the, the gospel has been committed to Peter for the circumcision, for the Jews. But it's been committed to me for the Gentiles. Paul is especially over the Gentiles. Now, although Paul has done very well in his apostleship, he's labored more abundantly than they, other apostles, all. Yet the modern church has treated Paul with the disdain that the Israelites had for Moses. There is hardly a Christian in the world that knows hardly anything about what Paul wrote. Check it out. He's been rejected. What are the things people debate about most? What Paul wrote. That's a subject. That's, that's where they debate and argue. When he actually, he's our apostle. And God gave him more than he gave the others. So the last became first. We've been, we Gentiles have been given access to things the Jews weren't given access to. Right. Yeah. Now they, on the apostolic level. Mm -hmm. You compare the writings of John and Peter with Paul. It's not that John and Peter didn't write truth. It isn't that, but it was, but Paul majored in foundational truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know anybody else that did it. Peter hinted at it when he referred to Christ as a foundation stone. But, well, it's a tragedy that he's been rejected largely by the Gentile church. If you, if you study any kind of modern scholarship, yeah. the, the, the tone yeah. of <laughs> biblical scholarship, people are offended at Paul. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal.
Now we read this uh, Jacob. Ja Joseph brought in Jacob and presented him. He set him, set him before Pharaoh. He, he wasn't afraid of what Pharaoh was going to think because there was a, sort of a dignity about Jacob because he'd had visions from God that tempered him and illuminated him and he was in a state of joy too at this time. So he sent him before Pharaoh until everything was settled about the land. See, he's not going to He's not going to officially give him the land until everything is settled. He's already showed him the shepherds. I was going to show him the, the head of the household. He's already told him that his father's house and his brethren, he's told him how to conduct themselves before Pharaoh. And his, his brother told him that they probably had their new, their new garments on. I imagine there was some kind of protocol involved in standing before a king. I know that when, uh, in Esther's day, when she, the king had to hold out the scepter, he had to, <laughs> he had to recognize you. Remember, she was afraid, since she'd really put on her best clothes, she went in there. When Tertullus, who was an orator, he was bringing up a case against Paul, when he stood before Felix, he did so in a formal manner. He didn't say, hey, you! Yeah, and after that, he, he had just a certain decorum. When Paul stood before Agrippa, he did not speak until he was formally recognized. And then he mentioned he referred to King Agrippa four times in what he said. When speaking of worldly rulers, Paul said to believers, give everyone what it is owed to them, to whom custom, to whom custom is due, I mean, if protocol is bow down, bow down. Yes, amen. It's not to worship. It's, it's to honor and okay. custom to whom custom is due. Peter admonished believers, honor the king now. Mm -hmm. Honor the king. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also a proper approach to God. Yes. All of this is a faint reflection of that. David said, now let's come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Amen. Just let's think how we're coming before him. Then he said, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Mm -hmm. Apostolic doctrine said, let's draw near now with a true heart. This is heavenly protocol with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, that's how you come, yes. come to God. And lo and behold, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. <coughs> Other versions, I apologize for some of these versions, but this is just what they said. Said, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh, then the NIV footnote is, that means greeted him. Gave him his blessing, basic Bible English. That's, that's pretty good. Paid his respects to Pharaoh. Greeted Pharaoh. Gave the king a blessing. I believe that men just what it said, he blessed Pharaoh. And he was a person who could do this. Of all the people in the world, he was in the he was in the promised lineage. He could speak for God, in other words. He could speak for God. I don't doubt that at Jacob did at least what Jeremiah told the captives of Israel to do. He told them, Seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused thee to you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. So, so pray for Joplin yeah. mm -hmm. that we'll have peace. Yes. You see, well, I like to pray for his conversion. Let's first pray for it peaceable yeah. right. so that it's not uh, 
unduly agitated. It does, it, it does seem to me that pray for rulers that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. Maybe that's why sometimes there's a lot of social agitation as the church hadn't been praying. Praying that, see, that you've got a man who can, leaders can subdue things to a degree. I like he blessed him. I, see, J principle stated in the book of Hebrews about the less, the greater blessing. Bless 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 yes, right. Yeah. Something right. significant about Jacob blessing Pharaoh, the ruler yes, of the right. land. Yes, right. And here comes, here comes this father of this tribe of yeah. 70 people, and yeah. he blesses he bless the him. ruler of, the, of yes, probably right. the most prominent a uh, land and nation at that time. Yes. They were, the only, they were feeding the world at that time. See, he represented yeah. God. This way it can't just be like a greeting because yeah. he was a spokesman yeah. for God. And Pharaoh looks at him. And I don't know if he was impressed with his age or they had folk that old in Egypt. I don't know. He said, how old are you? <clears throat> now, some of the opinion that Pharaoh had never seen a man this old. That's why he asked the question. Maybe so, I don't know. God promised Abraham, that he said, that Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So there's at least one explanation for him. God said to those calling upon the Lord, With long life will I satisfy him. Mm -hmm. Solomon said to his son, Wish he only had one. All those wives. All those wives of concubines. He just had one son. It's like yeah. the Lord, there's a message there. Solomon said to his son, Keep the commandments for a length of days and long life and peace shall he add to thee. So, if he was older than usual, it was, it was God that did it. Now, something important to note that the, in the, in the, History of the descendants of Abraham, age was like an important factor because there's the flesh and blood line is being built. See, so the longer these men of faith lived, the so it's a, it was different than ours because we're not part of a flesh and blood kingdom, but they were. Yeah. They were part of this flesh and blood. It was a transmission of the problem. That's right. That's right. So it seems to me that it's still the, still the case in some nations where where the aged are held in very high regard. That's right. That's right. And, and, and any so of those this, countries that are around Israel. Yeah, and, and this may have been something that you know that this, the Egyptians may have done that too. That's right. So Pharaoh recognizes this is man is ancient. He's, That's a, right. he's an aged man. So Jacob answers, "How old are you?" He says, "Well, the days of the years." The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Now, uh, I find the expression days of the years. That's a, but I didn't find anyone that was intrigued by that like I am, but I was intrigued by it. And that those words are in the Hebrew text. The Hebrew word yom is days. Shened is years. So the days of the years, That that is a... Valid expression. It is used by the authorized version one other time when accounting for the age of Abraham, days of the years. The following versions read, and I listen there, who read days of the years. The other versions read the years. One version says, my stay on earth. The days of my pilgrimage are 130 years. The whole time, Geneva Bible says, 130 long, hard years, the Living Bible says. And the easy-to-read version says, a short life. That's how they translated that. Now, there's a perspective to me of the words contained days, days of my years. Days speaks of the details of life. Works, growth, chastening, revelations, lessons, however you experiences. Years speaks of purpose, objective, profitability, assessment, testimony. 
It's the days that make the years tolerable. <laughs> Can you see that? And it's the days that make him blessed. See? In other words, God has been pleased to break life down into... Yes, please, Jason. Statement by Jacob to also be reflective of some great humility that Jacob had learned along the way. Oh yes. You notice he says it's not. I'm not to be compared to my. Yeah. To my father. This is this is a statement almost encapsulating his whole life that Jacob had learned a lot yeah. since he was a young man. He had he had learned how to depend on God. You know he yes. he'd, he'd yes. learned how to go through hardship. He'd been humbled along the way. I'm not saying he was an arrogant, proud man. That's not what I'm saying. But he had, he had learned a lot. He is a different man. Yeah. Here, this is a this is a, a statement of of. There's more in this statement than what might appear. <coughs> See, this age no doubt impressed Pharaoh, but as you say, it was an expression of humility because he said, "Wait, wait, yeah, I'm, there's some of my fathers have lived a lot longer, and I am old." I list there some Jacob, Jacob, Jacob's hard experiences, the epochal hard experiences, and the blessed experiences. They weren't 130 miserable years. That's what I'm trying to point out. That isn't what he was saying. Yeah. I've had 130 miserable years because some of them there were some real blessings that happened uh -huh. in those years. From the standpoint of experience, this would seem like years, while from the standpoint of faith, it would seem like it. So it was to Jacob when he labored seven years for, for Rachel. It said it seemed, seemed just a few days. Seemed like just a few days. Yeah. Now this here's this humble point that Brother Jason mentioned. I have not attained to my fathers. Abraham lived to be 175. Isaac lived to be 180. Jacob will die 17 years later at 147. Now, there's no perceived pattern in all this. Less is said about Isaac than any of the rest, yet he lives the longest. <laughs> Jacob had a more diverse experience than anybody else, and yet Abraham and Isaac both outlived him. See it? So there's no... This is just the Lord's working. Now remember, he'd already blessed Pharaoh once. Remember what he said? He blessed Pharaoh. Now he's going to do it again. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. So here's the second, <laughs> second time. He blessed him. When Jacob came the first time, now the second time. Now, see, blessing someone is not a common thing in our day. It was a common day to the Hebrews and it was in the Covenant, New Covenant writings too, is a blessing someone in in inculcating God upon the situation, bringing God into the situation. Like Melchizedek blessed Abraham, Isaac blessed Jacob, Laban and his father Bethuel blessed Rebekah, Laban blessed his daughters and their sons, Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Jacob blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, and Jacob blessed his 12 sons. So there's just one person blessing another person, but they're doing it in the behalf of God. Amen. They're calling God to be involved in that person's life. Now, an example is the Aaronic blessing that was Aaron was commanded to bless the people. Let's give you an idea what a, something, what a blessing can be. God told Moses, speak unto Aaron and, and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless <coughs> the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Now you might uh, resolve on yourself to find someone and actually do that, and it'll 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 affect 
It'll affect you. I could, I've done this. It, it will affect you. And then you remember that uh, these people that Aaron pronounces blessing on, God had just had said previously, I've seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. <laughs> that is what he said. Yeah. So when Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Do yeah. you, you remember this? Yeah. Remember this here. We'd rather see our enemies converted Amen. than be, to remain our enemies. So Pharaoh, think of it this way. Pharaoh had welcomed Jacob. <coughs> He'd welcomed his brothers into the land. He'd given them the best of the land. He'd withheld nothing from them. What makes more sense than to say, Lord, bless this man for what he's done. And he blessed him. And as long as Pharaoh lived, things went well. Why did they go well for the Israelites as long as he lived? He'd been twice blessed by Patriarch Jacob. Then it says Joseph gave him a possession in the land of in the possession of the land of Egypt, called it Ramesses. And it's the opinion of some, and maybe they're right, that Ramesses is what the area was called when Moses wrote this up. And before that, it was called Goshen. But I, I, that's what some have said. I don't, I'm not sure about it myself. But he gave them the land. He, and he, as I say, he was familiar with it. Whatever is required to situate them in that location, Joseph did it. it says Joseph, pl Joseph placed his father and his brethren. So whatever that involved, I, I don't know the details, but he made sure. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does. But you got to see this with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes sure that what God dictates happens. Joseph gave them the possession. And Jesus has given us a possession. In fact, he says, all things are yours. And the, uh, the final verse says, Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all the father's household with bread. Nourished. I gather that this he took from his own supply. Remember when they, when they came to Egypt and sat at his table, he f fed them in his house from his goods. I don't doubt that he gave them his own from his own allotment. Mm -hmm. Fed them well. He supplied all their need. Bread is food. He gave what they needed. May sound like a simple thing, but when we transfer this picture to the spiritual realm, we suddenly realize much is being served to the people of God today that is not appropriate for the spiritual palate. A lot of this going on. Starting with bread. And he, uh, he, according to their households, in this chart, I had the first sort of how big some of the households was. They differed in size. Some were kind of small. Some were very large. But the amount you got, amount each person, each head of the tribe got was appropriate to who was in the house. And then I gather he distributed it was according to the household. Now, this is the manner of God feeding the flock. I want to close with this. It's, that it's after the, in the manna, in the manna, the provision of manna, God revealed how he feeds his people. <laughs> now here's how, here were the rules. This is a thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it the manna, gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer, about two quarts for every man, according to the number of your persons. Every member of the household gets one omer. You got a husband and wife, two omers, one for each. You got a husband, a wife, a child, three omers, one for one for each. Count how many people in the house. Each person gets an omer. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, depending on the size of the family. When they were when they did meet it out with the omer, 
He that gathered much had nothing left over, and he that gathered little had no lack. In other words, if they had three babies and two adults and three seniors, they all got took one omer for each person, it all worked out. So everybody was able to eat everything they needed. Every, everyone was able to be filled. When they passed out the Jesus passed out the bread, it must have been on the same basis. Everybody was filled, but it took less to feed that little child than it did that robust fisherman. It's according to their eating. Now this is how the flock of God is fed too. Same way John broke down some spiritual categories within the church. He called them old men, young men, little children. He said the old men, see, they're, they're, they have a larger appetite. And they have more extensive understanding and they are more foundational work. They, the young men, they have a larger appetite than the little children. They have some understanding, some more extensive work, but less than the older men. But they have a pretty hefty appetite too. The little children have a small appetite. And they have less understanding, less extensive work. But when you, when each one, you got to set a full table each time. You have to put enough on the table so that the mature, the strong, have enough to eat. So the young men have enough to eat. And the little children have enough to eat. So you don't dumb it down. You don't have three different servings. Right. One for the old men, one for the young men, one for the children. No, it's a single serving. It's like it was when Jesus fed the multitudes. It was one serving. Right. But enough was put out there for everybody. So the, the gauge of what you preach is not determined by the little children. Yeah. It's not determined by the young men. Uh -huh. It's determined by the old men. Yeah. Because the children are going to eat the same thing the old men ate. It's just that the volume is going to be. And that's the secret to feeding the sheep. And if you feed the sheep this way, you'll find all of a sudden people will be growing up because they're eating the same diet, the same food. This is God's way. And you can't exploit this. You can't like make a career and make money because of this. This is just the way God does it. It's the way Jesus did it. He just taught the little children. They didn't. They didn't consume as much as the seasoned Pharisee that, that believed. But he set it all on the table. To so see when you prepare those of you that teach or preach or speak before people, don't address everything you say to just one part. Of the body of Christ, Amen. address it to the more mature. Speak it in such a way that they can understand. We understand that. That's God's manner. So, if the church is going to be strong, it has to be built up just as surely as these men. They're going to be good shepherds. They they had to be fed properly. They're going to be good shepherds, and the the children, like when Joseph was young, he would carry something to his brothers. Remember. David would say the same thing. He'd carry some cheeses and things to his brothers. So everybody had the work to do. Everybody had a certain appetite, but we all eat at the same trough. Yeah, that's, right. that's the genius of kingdom life. Why is it that way? Because it's actually the Lord is the one that's ministering yes. the nourishment. He's the one that's opening the eyes yes. and feeding the soul. He's the one that actually does it through what's being said. I'm sure you can see that. That's all I have tonight. If you have something you'd like to add. You know, when we, yes. Uh, back when I was a kid, we always, our meals were planned around what dad wanted, really. <laughs> you know, what he what he ate, yeah. ate, and the kids learned to eat that. But you messing up when you try to cater to the kids and serve them something that they like. When they grow up, say they can't, they don't. They don't know how to eat anything. Mm -hmm. They, they got to have these certain restricted diets because they, you know what I'm saying? Well, they didn't learn to eat it. everything that was set before. Yeah. And so I, I can see this as a spiritual parallel as yeah. well, that um, you, you've got to learn to eat. 
uh, those things. And one other thing I would say, I, I was particularly blessed by uh, what you had to say about how that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And, and you know, there's been a couple of times, and it's, it's regrettable that, that we didn't pick up on this, that the church didn't pick this up yeah. and, and carry it along. But there's been a couple of times I can remember in my early, uh, when I was blessed by men, yes, and, yeah. and, it, and it was. They called God in on it, you, yeah. and you could tell this yeah. was something. But I still remember it was a special, it had a special mm -hmm. significance to me, and I thought how uh, how it's such a regret that uh, we 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 haven't been able to do that, yeah. uh, and and because it's really um, I can see how that's uh, something really good. I can remember some of my most memorable experiences. I used to go through the neighborhood where I preached and asked people if they had something they'd like me to pray for, for them. And that's how I met Brother Bill Parsons. He was sitting down in the backyard condemning himself when I met him. When I asked him, boy, he leaped out of the chair. We've been friends ever since. But that is a marvelous ministry. We know a lady, she's passed on, uh, Thora Shaw was her name. And the church has pretty well booted her out so she started a ministry called Jesus and she went to the courthouse here in town and she'd sit out in the lobby where people were waiting to go in to have their case heard mm -hmm. and she'd cozy up to them and ask them if they'd like her to tell them pray for them and tell them about Christ and she it developed into quite a ministry that's what she did so there's a <laughs> There's a place for blessing people. Amen. There surely is. Amen. I was considering as you were speaking about preaching the same thing to all. Mm -hmm. um, nutritionally speaking, if you water something down, you're losing nutrients yeah. from, right. from that certain That's product. Right. And it's the same mm -hmm. thing with the, with the things of God. Is when you water those things down, you're losing the, um, the nutrients that comes from living on every word of God to be able to sustain Amen. yourself. And so there's there's nutrition. And, and I was thinking as Brother Tony was speaking, there are some things that we just don't really care to eat when we're kids, but we need them yeah. because they're good for you. Mm -hmm. And the same things with the, the things that are spoken from the Lord. Some of those things are a little bit hard to to get down, but you have to, yeah, <laughs> because amen. if you don't, your life yeah. isn't going to be sustained. Yeah. Yes. You know, I, I had a lot of these experiences, and I still do, when I would recall something I had heard said or preached a long time ago, and I didn't understand it, and all of a sudden it come to my mind that that would never have happened if I would have, you know, been in the nursery. <laughs> Yeah. I remember having a vigorous disagreement over these matters, mm -hmm. feeding and preaching yeah. with a group years ago. And uh, but the the reality is when you you know they, they want you they wanted me to focus on the young people, they wanted me to focus on those who didn't know the Lord and so forth and and, and uh, the the reasoning of this is, you know, these little ones, when we think about them sitting at the table with us, they naturally want to eat they want to eat. Mm -hmm. And they want to eat what we're eating. Yeah, they see yeah. us eating. They want some of it. Yeah. And they, they can't, you've already said, they can't eat as much as we do. But they want what we're eating. Amen. They sure Amen. do. They may not like the taste of something, but when they see us eating it, they, they, they're glad to take it and eat it. So forth. It's the same way in the kingdom. The younger ones will eat what they see the older ones eat. If they see mature, stable, godly people gladly feasting, on the truth, then they'll want it too, yeah. generally speaking. Amen. I can remember as a, as a child, we, had, we would eat fish, but this before they had deboned fish. The, the fish, I never ate any deboned fish. When I was young, I couldn't, be trusted so my mother would fit, take the bones out. You, and then I'd get this little pile of fish and I'd be able to eat. That's what parents can do yeah. with spiritual things. You can take right. the bone, take the bones out, and That's right. yeah. Yeah. serve it up to them. Make it, yeah. Till you learn to pick the bones out. That's right. Yeah. I couldn't pick them out. I, yeah. 
and it, it was too dangerous. So by, by my mother, and which meant she was the last one generally to eat. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All the same thing. Yeah, that's right. But that's we get right. different portions of it. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. we're able to um, to it's make it. Instead that manna, isn't it marvelous yeah. how that manna and it fell in the morning? That didn't, not at night. If you picked it up in the morning, not at night. Well, we all we all feed on Christ. He's the bread. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And so when we when we we're gonna feed the flock of God, it's. It's you've got to somehow bring bring Christ to the yeah, people, right. the people yeah. of Christ. That's that's the intent. That, I'm mm -hmm. the bread. Yeah. 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 Amen. Some, there's a lot of misconceptions about this. What we're talking about. Oh, I know it. And some people think that what we're talking about is like when you. It's like somehow you give this very intellectual lecture to, <laughs> that's right. but that's not what we're talking about no, at all. That's right. It's right. It's about, It's more the the. the Bringing Christ into right. the Amen. to people, so Amen. that He's real to people. Because you, you feed on Him, that's what you feed on. Not that's right. you don't feed on just being intellectual. That doesn't feed your spirit. You can Amen. someone could give a learned dissertation on John six, and you wouldn't. It wouldn't be. <laughs> it wouldn't be the bread and the. And Jesus made it all. plain that He said, "I am the bread of life." Amen. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Yeah. So he, Mm -hmm. it, 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 it has to sum up to Christ. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's edifying when you consider that Goshen was just like sitting there. <laughs> it was already prepared. It was already ready for them. And, and so when they got there, they didn't have to say, well, where are we going to cram these people in? There was a land already prepared That's for right. them. Mm -hmm. And Joseph um, had it all ready, <laughs> ready to go. Amen. All right, we'll have a closing word for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record. We thank you most of all for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a nourishing factor in the kingdom. How grateful we are that we can be made partakers of Christ. We give thee thanks that we see this. Well, for a long time, many of us didn't see this, but now that we see it, how adequate it is, Father, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.